Well, at two places, as you can see, the exascaleproject.org and also the ideasproductivity.org events. So we want to improve the series, so please give us feedback using this other uh, link that we have that you can see at the bottom of this slide. So we encourage questions, so uh, I would like this webinar to be interactive. So, um, but we need to we need to keep everyone in, everyone's mic muted because uh, we uh, we have a lot of participants. And with that, Ross, please, would you start? Hey, Ross, are you speaking? Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can hear you now, thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I got muted and it didn't tell me I got muted. It's interesting. Yeah, let me start over about that. Um, all right, so I'm going to go over some intermediate Git material. As mentioned, I will stop a few times uh, to ask um, some of the helpers to verbalize some of the questions that were submitted on chat. Uh, for some answers that might take a little longer, I might defer to later if there's material that will cover um, and answer those questions. Um, and also, I'll hang on after, after the uh, end of the hour if there's um, uh, longer questions that need to be addressed. And I think there's potentially an, uh, um, a set of office hours that will be run uh, in a couple of weeks with WebEx that will come on and be able to answer more significant questions uh, about the material that is presented here. So with that, let me get started. So the view here is that the sort of the, the tack I'm going to take is that the best way to learn Git is as a, a data structure and a set of core algorithms to manipulate and query that data structure, because a set of Git commands are kind of too confusing to just memorize commands. Now, the Git data structure is the best conceptual model for Git when you're working with Git. Um, I think that's been demonstrated lots of times. And you can see the basics of this data structure in your local repository by running commands like git log, one line graph, um, and there's a graphical tool called Git K that's installed on most machines that will give you kind of a graphical view of the graph. Now I'm not going to talk much or really at all about workflows as part of this talk because there's not time for that. Um, I actually give a, um, a longer talk about workflows um, for people who are interested in that. But uh, if you understand the basics of Git as a data structure and algorithms, then it's pretty easy to understand a variety of different workflows. Conversely, if uh, you don't understand the basics of the Git data structure and workflows, um, then, I mean, sorry, the, the Git data structure and algorithms, then almost any Git workflow that someone presents to you is going to be confusing. And we've seen examples of this time and time again. So it's, it's worthwhile to build this conceptual model that I'm going to present here. So once you have this conceptual model, then, you know, you want to create yourself a little cheat sheet um, for the commands that you use regularly as part of, of, of your currently adopted workflows and memorize the basic Git commands that you use a lot. But for everything else, just Google it because you'll find good, um, you'll find good answers and, uh, and uh, for the questions that you might have. And every project that adopts Git should um, list out the exact commands for the accepted workflows and conventions for their project on some wiki site somewhere that everyone can refer to. You can see examples of that at the links here for Pets and Chilinos where, where those projects have done that. So with that, let me get started. So this is showing an index of the material that I'm going to um, either skim over or go into in detail here. 
So let me just state that the goal for going uh, for this particular webinar is to present some of the basics um, and gain some comfort and familiarity with these websites and with these references so that you can go back on your own and spend a little more time with these references and learn what you need to learn about the basic Git data structures and core algorithms. There's not enough time in an hour-long session to really teach you everything that you need to learn and to have absorb that. Some people will get it. Uh, some people will take a little longer. Everyone's different. And I also point to some other good tutorial references that you can go after. So with that said, let me go ahead and jump in here. First, let me show you a, um, a page on the Ideas Productivity website. Um, I think it didn't seem to come up. Let's try it again. There we go. So there's this page here on the ideas-productivity.org site under resources, how-to documents. There's a variety of different documents on different topics here. Let me uh, point out the section on version control. There's a short little two-page overview of version control that I'm not going to open just because it's, it's very basic material. If you, if you don't know what version control is and never used it, this would be cases where version control would be very helpful for, helpful for you and your project. Um, this other little short two-page document that we wrote called How to Do Version Control with Git in Your CSE Project. So just open that very briefly here. This is a short two-page document that uh, describes some of the basic setup and usage of Git um, and some of the workflow building blocks. Uh, just some basic details on Git setup. Um, some, some guidance on how to learn Git, either uh, go through the reference material that I'm going to show here, or if you want a more structured course, you can take the Udacity course called How to Use Git and GitHub. It's free. It's more detailed, but I think for a lot of people that may be a better solution um, for learning the basics of Git, which is very consistent with the material that I'm going to show today. And uh, other questions, just do a Google search. You'll find a great Stack Overflow article on it. So don't sweat the details. You can, you can just look those up with Git. Um, I'll go over some of the basic tips for using Git. Um, but they're basically listed out here. That's on a different reference. Um, and then I got a whole page here that uh, describes some of the basic building blocks for Git workflows. Every Git workflow I've ever seen designed in the last 10 plus years are all built out of these building blocks. So I don't go over any of these building blocks in this presentation because I don't have time for that. But if you learn the basics of the Git data structures, then it's much easier to understand these workflow building blocks and how to construct your own workflows for your project. And again, that's a different talk that I give uh, that's a little bit longer um, if people are interested at some point. Okay, so coming back to the how-to page. So I'm going to spend most of my time here in this Git tutorial reference collection. And I go over basically the links here. So in case we get disconnected over the um, over the computer for some reason, you can just click on this link and you'll pretty much be there. Let me go back over there to this reference collection. So this is a page I put together a couple years ago for the Ideas Productivity Project. Um, and this is a set of links to tutorial and reference information with some text around them. It takes the view that the best way to learn it is as a learn it as a data structure and a set of algorithms. Um, which is consistent with this little blog article and tutorial that I point to here. And it's because the Git command line interface is very confusing um, and uh, is not very consistent to a lot of people's view. For example, same Git command like checkout can do very different things depending upon the other arguments that you pass in and the state of your repository. But Git's still the dominant version control system these days. We still need to learn to use it. Okay. So um, if you want a full-featured introduction to Git with all the gory details, um, you can read the book Pro Git in its second edition. It's free online. Uh, you can be nice to these guys and buy the print version. About nine years ago, I bought the first version of this, and I read through the entire book in one sitting, basically in one day, and did some experimentation, and it helped me tremendously. Um, but that's not the best choice for everybody, I don't think. Um, and I, honestly, I don't think a lot of the material there is the best reference material, um, but it's very comprehensive. 
I think some of the references I'm going to show you are actually much better um, to go back and look at on a regular basis. But for in-depth discussions of topics, that's a great place to go. So if you're that kind of person, then feel free to go ahead and read the whole book. It made a big difference for me. First, I'm going to start with some basic uh, critical Git beginner tips that a lot of people don't do or don't know about Git that will help you to avoid trouble and avoid angering uh, and upsetting other people in your project that are more uh, savvy with Git and avoid problems down the line. So there's a set of couple different tips here. First, first one is that on every computer, set up your, uh, your Git settings with Git config and make sure you use consistent username and user email address on every machine. Otherwise, you will show up with several different people in the Git uh, history, which is very confusing. Um, so that's the first thing to do. And then you want to set up settings like color, the default push. There's this feature called Git re 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 that I might mention, but I think most people want that turned on by default. But you can read that reference and see what Git re 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 is. Basically, it helps you address issues of resolving similar merge conflict issues in an automated way after you've done it once. So there's that. Another really important thing is how to write good, how to create good commits and write good commit messages. So what you don't want to do is do six months worth of work and then squash it into one big huge commit and push it generally. That's considered bad. And because that screws up the ability to do things like doing get bisect to find defects in uh, all the changes you made in six months, or how long it's been. Um, you can't do things like uh, cherry pick individual changes. You can't do things like revert individual changes. Um, so you want to organize your commits into what's called uh, logical change sets. So there's this Git workflows man page that comes with Git. Every version of Git has it. And there's a section called separate changes and describes what this means, how you organize your changes into logical commits. Then the Udacity course has this really nice section on one commit per for logical change solution, which you can just jump to the course and jump to that section and read about that. So that's how you organize changes into commits. And then there's this whole deal about how to write the commit message itself. There's a nice article that I linked to here on how to write a good commit message. First, most important thing is have a short summary line um, that summarizes the commit uh, and the changes in the commit, and then a complete blank line to longer text that then you format to about 72 characters, and then you want to mention references here. A lot of the Git commands basically pull out the summary line, and you really want a short summary line that describes it so you understand what it means when you do Git interactive rebase or looking, just look at the Git log, for example, the Git log one line, for example. Okay, so that's really important. Um, and you can set up automatic hooks in your repository to enforce this actually if you want, but very few projects do that. Another thing is it's really helpful to create a lot of little checkpoint commits when you're working in Git locally here. You get something mostly working, you think that's a good state, go ahead and create your local commit there, and then keep going. And then if you screw something up, you can go back to your last commit uh, very easily and get, so it's like a nice set of undos. And then you can reorganize and squash some of those commits together and organize them with Git Interactive Rebates. You can read, read about Git Interactive Rebates in this link here. Okay, um, you always want to create, so at least for me, I always want to create local commits in local branches before I run any Git commands that might modify uh, local uncommitted changes, things like git pull, merge, rebase, and certainly commands like git checkout and reset and clean. These can blow away your uncommitted changes and can do strange things. So I generally always commit before I run these commands. But again, I can go back and modify these commits later and squash them and get rid of them and so forth. And you really should be backing up your branches every couple of hours. If you're committing things to a local branch, you can push it to some other repository very easily. That way, if your local machine goes out, it just blows up, you haven't lost your work. So it's really kind of nicely back, um, built in there. Uh, S is you can always recover an earlier state of your local branches in your working directory by, because you commit things locally. Um, you can use uh, a, a, a command called get rep log to see where things were in the past, and you can use that in a combination of git checkout and git reset hard, for example, to get back to earlier states. So you can always get back to an earlier state of your repository no matter what you do, as long as you follow these few simple guidelines. And from that, we get to G, which is never delete your local git repository unless you're completely done with it. There's a wealth of information that's only in your local git repository that's not replicated anywhere else. 
um, things like get read, read, read information, get ref log, and so forth. And because of F, you can always recover a state. You never have to do that. So if you've ever been in a situation, or you're still in situations where you're doing things and get you get kind of in a state where you don't know how to get out of where you are, and then you feel you have to delete your repository and recall it, it means you haven't learned the basics of Git well enough to kind of uh, be more uh, productive with Git and, and be a little more confident with it. So you should never be, the only time you ever delete your local repository, if you're not done with it, is if you have actually corrupted commits, which is only happens if you have a corrupted disk section, which is extremely rare. It, it does happen, but I've, I've never seen it in any of the projects that I've worked with. So here's another big one. Don't commit large generated binary files in your Git repository. They get, and once you push those to a shared branch, they get stuck there forever. And it's very difficult to get rid of them with this like filtering process. So um, just really don't want to do it. You can set commit hooks to stop that from happening. But I think very few projects do that. I think we probably should do that more. This is a, a big problem for a lot of new people with, with Git who don't understand how to use Git. The other thing about Git is poorly designed for, gen for handling large binary files. It's terrible. But there's some add-ons that you can use to make that a little bit better, but still not fantastic. And lastly, never do a force push to a remote branch that's shared with other people unless everyone knows what's going on there. Because that can really screw people up, especially people who are not as savvy with Git. So let me pause just for one second uh, to see if there's any uh, quick questions about this before I move on. We haven't had any questions come in yet, Ross. Excellent. Good deal. All right, let me move back here. And now I'm going to spend the majority of the rest of this um, time going through this visual Git reference. It's a very short reference. It's probably the most useful reference I've ever seen on Git, and I still refer to it on a regular basis. So it's all in one. Uh, HTML page, and it deals with Git as a data structure and a set of algorithms. So let me start out with the conventions here. So this is, this essentially is the essence of the Git data structure. So you've got, so you've got the working directory. Now that's your local directory for all the files that you see. Everything else on this uh, diagram is all inside of a hidden directory called .gitdit. Dot .git, um, and it's all hidden away there. So you got this thing uh, called a staging area. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now up here in green, we've got a set of commits. Each commit represents a snapshot of your repository, and it really is stored as a snapshot, but kind of in a smart way. Git doesn't store these as diffs, at least not for recent commits. Every commit is addressed by a 40-character SHA-1, um, that is unique, um, but most smaller, most smaller repositories uh, can actually get away with just giving the first five, six, seven, or eight characters of the SHA-1. So for small repositories, you can usually get away with just a few characters, which is pretty useful. As repositories get bigger and more changes, then you need more characters in the SHA-1 to uniquely identify it. It's kind of a nice feature of SHA-1s. Um, and every commit points to its parent or parents. And this, is, and this represents the history. So this is a this is a this is a directed acyclic graph. I'll show you later. Right now it's just a line. It's not very interesting, but I'll show you how you get a graph out of this. Um, and this represents the history. And then we've got these things called branches or branch references. Master is a typical one people have. Uh, another one in this example is maint, like a maintenance branch for release you're trying to maintain. And then there's a thing called head that points to where essentially where the current working directory is pointing to. Uh, and right now, head by default sits on top of master when you clone a repository generally. And I'll show you why that is significant later. Now, stage is kind of a confusing aspect of Git that, um, um, yeah, it's different from other virtual systems. It's basically an area where you aggregate the changes that you want to go into the next commit. It, it can be kind of a utility for that. Um, so with that, uh, and I'll describe more issues of this. I'll describe more about this data structure as, as you go through this page here. Let me come back up here to uh, conventions. So the way you get changes into and out of these different places is you make changes in local files in your working directory. You type git add to stage those files in the staging area, and then anything that's staged gets added to the next commit. Likewise, you can use git reset and checkout to pull changes out of the history or the most current commit um, into the staging area and then back down the working directory. 
or like me, um, a lot of times I just ignore and, uh, the staging area and just jump over it. For example, if you type git commit dash a or you list files, it will go directly from um, what's in the working directory and commit that into the next commit. Likewise, you can use git checkout head to jump over the staging area. So you can largely ignore the staging area in a lot of different um, the kinds of operations that you have to do. This is kind of useful. But there, are, but, but, but there are times where the staging area is incredibly helpful, um, if, especially if you want to commit only pieces of files at a time. That's a more advanced thing I won't talk about here. Okay, so that's the basic usage. Now let me jump down here to the most useful diagram in this entire collection, and one I probably refer to the most. This is one of the most confusing aspects of Git. So this is what diff does. This is the things that diff, show, diff shows you. Okay, so let's say, say, for example, you have some file foo, and you make some changes to it in the working directory, and then you type git add foo, and then you make some more changes to foo before you commit. Now, if you type git diff right now, right, right at that point, it will show you only the changes between you made in foo since you staged the file. It doesn't show you the full set of commits or, or the full set of changes that would be committed if you did, if you said git commit dash a or git commit foo, foo.cpp or something like that. So that's very confusing. Um, and you don't see the, the cache changes either. So if you want to see the changes that are in staging that will be going to the next commit, you've got to pass in this dash dash cached option. And if you just want to skip over the stage and just see all the full set of changes, you type git diff head. So that's how you do it. So I get confused about this all the time. i got to go back and uh, look at this diagram. And then, of course, you can diff anything else. You can diff what's in the current working directory with anything that's in any named branch reference or any raw git commit ID. You can diff between any two commits in the directed ASEC with graph, and it'll show you the differences. Either line by line, by default, or file by file, there's lots of commands, lots of options to pass into diff to see exactly um, how you want to see the changes. So that's diff. Let's move on to commit. Now here's where we start to grow the graph, okay? The graph of, of graph of commits. So when you type commit, let's say you've staged some files here with git add, what commit does, in this case head is sitting on top of master, it takes the, the updated files that have been that have been added to the stage, it creates a new commit for a new snapshot of the repository for the updated files. It also points to the files that haven't changed since since since, since, since your last commit and creates a new commit object and moves head and master over to the new commit. This is the basics of how you grow the history and record your changes to your repository. That's very common. Um, so the way that you uh, take this line and turn it into, um, start turning into a graph or a tree in this case is let's say that head is sitting on top of another branch, main in this case, for some release let's say that you're calling main, um, and you create a commit there. Now we create um, a branch in the history. So now the history has diverged between the master branch and the maintenance branch. And I'll show you commands for combining these two histories later if you want with git merge and rebase. Let's git commit. Now another kind of very useful commit is sometimes you'll make some changes, you'll, need, you'll do a commit, and then you'll, um, and then you'll run some testing and figure out that things are not quite right. That things are still things are broken. So you want to you know fix it up. Rather than create a new commit, what you can do is you can amend the current commit. So you can fix the files, or let's say that the log message is not quite right. You can fix the log message. to git commit amend. Now what's interesting here is that you don't actually amend the current commit at the misnomer. Git does not modify any existing commit in this data structure. This is an immutable data structure. Once git creates a commit. It never, all you do is create new commits and new parts of the graph. So in this case here, it creates a new snapshot of the repository and a new commit, um, and then moves master and head over to that. Now this commit ED489 then becomes an orphaned commit. Now this might seem very wasteful, but if it's just a couple of files that you're changing here, you're really adding very little extra storage to the git, um, to the .git directory and the git database, and I'll describe later about how Git stores these changes, understand why that's the case. So this is really not very wasteful. Now, by default, this, these, these orphan commits will sit in your local repository for months, like I think like six months or something is the default. 
You can always find them again by doing git ref log and, and be able to recover them later if you want to. Um, but then git will at some point de delete these in a process called garbage collection, the command called git cg, which actually runs automatically on git push um, in, in some cases. Um, so anyway, so that's a key aspect of git is that this data structure is immutable. All you do is add nodes to it and add edges, and you may delete nodes and edges that are not being referred to by any um, branch or uh, or tag or something like that. Okay, so that's commit. Now let's go to some of the more common commands that are also the most, most, most confusing commands. So let's go to checkout. Now in this version of checkout, um, if you pass in the name of a git commit reference, now head tilde means to commit before head. So if I go down to head to master, it's ED489. So head tilde would be the one before that. That's DA985. And if you give it a set of files, it leaves head where it is, but it copies the state of those files and puts them in the staging area and the working directory. So basically like undoes that commit uh, or the changes of that commit and gives you basically uh, what the version of those files are there from the previous. Now, I almost never do this, but I guess there are some occasions where um, where you want to do this. That's a typical workflow that I do. Okay, so notice head did not move there, but now I just updated files. Okay, now the most more common thing you do with checkout is you give it, give it the name of a branch reference, okay, like mate. So if you're on head and you want to check out the mate branch, you say git checkout mate. Now here it actually does move head from, from master to mate. In this case, actually, it's interesting, head's actually uh, just stored as a file in your .git directory, and inside that file, it'll say mate. It's really that simple. And actually, master and, and mate are, are files also in your .git directory, and they just store 40 character SHA-1s. It's a very simple data structure if you look at it. Anyway, so I digress. So that's what, so this is the most typical thing, is when you work on one branch, you want to work on a different branch. Um, wait. So there's a, um, I'll, 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 I'll pause for, for, a, for a comment and a question uh, in a little bit here. Uh, so we do have a question from Rob Jacob. Uh, he oh, would sure. like to know how large is too large of a binary for Git? Um, well, okay, so GitHub will only allow you to do files up to 100 uh, meg. That's a GitHub limit. And the rest of it is just is just relative. If you have small little binary files, and if you don't care about how inefficiently Git is managing those files, it's not a big deal to have a few binary files. But if these binary files are dominating the size of your Git storage, and over time if these files are changing a lot, then they will dominate your storage. Um, so it's 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 all relative essentially. Um, so I don't think there's there's a clear limit for how big is too big. It depends upon several different issues which related to how often those files will change, how much, how large is the rest of the repository, so on and so forth. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. I guess the answer is it depends. Yeah, so, so we have one more question from Jason Gates. He was sure. uh, curious, is there a way to set how long things live in the ref log, specifically how far back will the ref log go? I think so, yeah. So go ahead and read the documentation for Git Garbage Collection, for Git CG, and it'll tell you how to set those options in your local repository. I mean, in general, I would recommend people don't fiddle with those settings just because it doesn't really create a lot of waste. And those orphan commits, they don't get pushed in any other repositories. You're not going to muck up other repositories. It's just a little extra disk space in your own repository. Um, and every once in a while, Git will do it for you automatically. So I almost never worry about it. But if you are worried about it, then um, go ahead and read the documentation. I mean, everything in Git is pretty much configurable. You make Git do anything you want, um, and there's an option for it somewhere. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Russ. Those are the only questions so far. Excellent. Okay, so that's the checkout. That's the main thing that you do. Okay, um, now there's another uh, way to use checkout, which is used actually very commonly, um, and it's shown here. So I start out with head sitting on top of master, and then let's say I want to check out three commits before master. That's what this tilde means. It means three commits before master. Now here, notice that it actually does move head. It moves head, and it makes my working directory and my staging.
Hey, Ross, we cannot hear you. Hey, Ross. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Sorry, I don't know what happened, but we can hear you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for interjecting here. I didn't. Interesting. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so this is a form. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I was muted there, but this is the form where you basically give a, a relative get, uh, reference. Um, so Git checkout master tilde three is identical to saying Git checkout v three two five c. It moves head to that commit, puts you in what's called a detached head state, and update the reference. And Git commits. I mean, Git prints out a pretty scary warning message about this. Um, but you don't need to be scary about it to understand what a detached head state is. And generally, you do this to reproduce old versions of the code. Same thing happens when you check out a tag version of the code. Um, a tag is not a branch, and I'll mention tags later if I have time. Um, it puts you in this cross called detached head state. That, that allows you to build a version of the code, inspect it, and so on and so forth. Um, it all, it's also you use that uh, git checkout uh, as part of a git bisect. If you've heard of git bisection, you can look at that on your own. Um, so this is something you do a lot. Just know that if you commit in this state, it does something very different, and that's described down here, which I won't go over, but you can commit things in a detached head state. I don't recommend it, because if you move off of it, then that commit becomes orphaned, and you've got to find it with get ref log. And then they tell you to go ahead and create a new a branch or that if you want to save it. So if you want to go full around somewhere, please create yourself with a temporary branch and repository, and then create new commits and mess around with it. Then you can come back to it later. It doesn't get lost. Okay, so that is the checkout command. Now let me talk about a related command called git reset, which is does very similar things to git checkout. And actually, this is some of the biggest confusion about git that I see on Stack Overflow and different places on the web. Is these commands do very similar things. In fact, there are certain combinations of, 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 of arguments you can pass in where they do exactly the same thing. That's why it's confusing. Now, let's, let's deal with this git reset. Okay, now let's, say, let, let's say that I'm in my local repository. I've made several commits. And my last three commits are just garbage. I, 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 they, I don't want them any longer. This was a bad way to go, and I want to just forget that they were ever there. Now, these are commits that I've not shared anywhere. These are just in my local repository. So one easy way to forget about those three commits is just to do git reset dash dash hard, um, so it's the working directory, and then give it a, a, a commit reference. So typically, I wouldn't do head tilde three, which is shown here. I would say git reset dash dash hard b three. C. That just what that does is it moves your head and your master. So what's interesting about, about checkout and reset is that reset actually moves the branch reference, not just head. If you did checkout, if you place reset with checkout, it would move just head, but it, it would leave master pointing back at ED489. So that's a big difference between checkout and reset. And now these three commits can become orphaned commits. And at some point, Git will garbage collect them and will delete them. So that's the essence of Git Reset. So I use Git Reset all the time in various workflows. It's extremely helpful to use it. You gotta understand what it means because you can do bad things, especially if you Git Reset hard and you force push. <laughs> you can really screw things up. Another version of Git Reset is just uh, basically unstaging files. You can physically, you don't like anything that's staged, you can unstage it with Git Reset and that takes care of it. Um, or you can unstage individual files with Git Reset and you don't like the fact that you stage some of them, you want to get them out, you can restage, uh, you can unstage just those files. So that's reset, so that's another confusion. Git reset actually moves the branch reference, like master, git checkout never moves master, it just changes what, what, what head points to. I don't know, think that the words uh, checkout and reference, or, or uh, checkout and, and, um, and reset necessarily describe those, those, uh, those behaviors, but that's what they do. So. Anyway, I think these, these, these do a pretty good job of that. So these commands that I've shown above for reset and checkout, these don't actually touch that underlying graph of commits. They just change what your working directory is pointing to, and they change where branch references like master and head point to. But they don't touch that underlying graph. Now, other commands like merge and rebase, they, they, do, have, they do actually um, expand the graph. Or we only expand the graph, we never modify the graph. So one kind of merge that is, happens very often is um, what's called a fast forward merge. Let's say that you're on the maintenance branch, um, and you made no changes on the maintenance branch, and you want to update the maintenance branch with uh, master. 
not recommend this as a workflow, but I'm just telling you that this is what you can do. Um, if you say get merge master, by default, if the branch you're on is a direct ancestor of the branch you want to merge to, it, it just basically just moves the branch reference forward to point to that commit. So it doesn't create any new um, commits in the graph. So this is called a fast forward merge, and it's the right thing to do in a lot of different contexts. So that's the fast forward merge. And of course, it updates um, your stage in your working directory to be the new version as of that commit. Now, sort of the you know the quote, real merge occurs is when you have really have two separate histories. So let's say that I'm on the master branch. It's currently pointing to ED four uh, four eighty nine. And I got some other local branch here called other that has two commits on it. And let's say that I want to merge in the changes from other into master. This would be like a topic branch workflow, very common to do in Git. So you type, so I'm on master, I type git merge other. This is sort of where the real complexity in Git and kind of, kind of the magic of Git is. Um, Git uses the knowledge of the common history of these two branches to merge the changes to these files together uh, into a new commit. Now, so what it does is all the files that merge cleanly, it puts them into the staging area. If all the files merge cleanly from a textual standpoint, it'll go ahead and create a new commit and open up your, your uh, editor to edit the commit message. And you might want to type something in there about why you're merging this branch and what it does. So forth. that's called kind of first parent history. Yeah. This is called a three-way merge. Um, so that's fine. Uh, now, if things don't merge cleanly, what happens is that Git takes the files that don't merge cleanly and it leaves them in the working directory and puts in conflict markers. So if you use Git CDS or SDN with the greater, greater than, less than, less than, less than, uh, you know, markers, you go in and you manually uh, remove those conflict markers and you manually uh, resolve the merge conflict, essentially. Um, and then once you've done that, you do type Git add, and then you can type Git commit, and it will create the new commit for you. So I just I'll just tell you that real quick. I mean, this is the most dangerous aspect of version control with any system, including Git. Um, so many defects are added when you're doing merging, um, especially if there's any kind of significant changes between these two branches. Like there should be entire code reviews just devoted to just um, just reviewing merges like this. And Git, the Git gives you the command so you can see exactly. Um, so um, I'll answer that question in um, a little bit here. I have to get through um, rebase here. So right, uh, where was I? Right. So get merged. This can be very dangerous. So uh, this is the most dangerous aspect of doing uh, software development with version controls, merging changes. Anyway, the Git gives you commands. You can very carefully inspect. Um, the changes with respect to each branch to know exactly what you're merging there. And, and check that very carefully because a lot of defects get, get added there. So that's merge. That's a really great command. Another important command um, is a command called cherry pick. Now, what cherry pick does is let's say I'm on master. Let's say that I'm on master, but I only want one of the changes, one of the commits essentially from some other branch, you know, a topic branch in this case. So if you type, so if I'm on master and if I type git cherry pick 2C33A, what git does is it basically takes the patch that represents the changes between git 2C33A and the previous snapshot or the previous commit 169A, takes that patch and it applies that patch into the updated files, the changed files on the master branch as of ED489. It applies that. And it applies the patch. If there's conflicts, it'll 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 tell you conflicts, and it'll give you conflict markers that you have to work out, and so forth. Um, again, Git does that because it knows the common history. It goes back to that common commit between these two histories, these two branches, and is able to do that together, and does that pretty well usually. So that's Git cherry pick. Now, you don't really use Git cherry pick in a lot of workflows because it creates a lot of duplicate commits in your history, which looks really ugly, actually. Um, and you can read about that in the Git Workflow 7 man page that describes work, uh, recommended workflows with Git. That's worth reading. Okay, so that's, that's cherry pick. Now let's talk about rebase. Rebase is another very important command, probably one of the most confusing commands that exists in Git. And 
can lead to some really bad things if you don't understand what rebase is doing. So lots of warnings there. But I'll tell you that it's always safe to rebase commits that only live in your local repository before you share them. That is always safe to do. In fact, that's usually recommended to do. So what's shown here is basically a step of, you know, like a topic branch workflow. I've got a topic branch. I've got two commits on it. Let's say I want to bring that topic branch up to date with respect to what's on master branch. Um, I could merge it, but then that creates kind of a messy history at some point and do lots of merges. So one recommended way to do that is to rebase my topic branch on top of master. So that's what this git rebase does. And what rebase does is it does a cherry pick for each individual commit going back to the common history. So it takes the patch that represents the change from 169A6 uh, and A43, whatever, and it applies that cherry pick, that patch, and then, take, and then takes the next commit and applies that patch and so forth and, and so on until we get the updated, now nice linear branch, okay? Um, and we get new commits there. And again, these are orphan commits. They'll be reclaimed in garbage collection at some point, but not to worry. And for a lot of workflows, this is the best way to keep your topic branch up to date with respect to the branch that you'll eventually merge into. And then there's a, a version that does um, merge onto, but um, I won't deal with that. I almost never use that. At the bottom of this page, we've got some technical notes about how things are actually stored in the Git repository and what the index is and how the repository snapshots are stored as blobs. But I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later if I have time. Um, and then he's got a little walkthrough here where he um, uh, shows a little repository you can set up and then shows what the stage and the working tree and the current branch head looks like for different changes in files. So you, can, you can walk through that if you want to see sign up, um, you, know, um, you know, how these changes are managed by Git, essentially. So it takes maybe 10 minutes to walk through that example. Okay. And then he references to this other site that I'm going to go through soon here. Uh, actually, next, to, to visualize Git, Git concepts in D3. So before I do that, I want to pause for a second to uh, maybe answer any uh, quick questions about the material that I just presented. Um, so I saw there was one comment. Um, does someone want to say what that comment was? Okay. Well, if there's no saying the comment, I can deal with them after the fact. Are, are people still hearing me? Hey, Ross. I'm, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, I can, I can repeat the question. It said, uh, Nick asked us, do we have any documentation like best practices for Git workflow for scientific codes? He said, there's some freedom in the Git workflow and philosophical disagreements as to how that workflow would look like. So he said, sometimes, you know, trivial things can become overly complex. So, so do you have any good documentation or best practices for using the Git workflow for scientific codes? You mean just a simple topic branch workflow where you create a, a single branch and then, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it depends on, on the individual project. And I don't know that computational projects are radically different from other projects. Um, I, I guess I'd have to see a, a direct example of that. But I mean, just in general, when when when, when you're, I mean, we're getting a computation of workflow here, which we don't really have time to do. But um, um, yeah, there's, anyway, there's a whole set of philosophies about about how to create workflows in Git, um, and we can talk about those a, a little bit later, maybe um, maybe after the presentation is over, we can maybe mention some workflow details. But, but, but just know that whatever those workflows are, if you understand these basic concepts, it's going to be very easy for everyone in your project to adopt those workflows and to use them well. If they don't understand what I'm presenting here, then they're going to be lost. They're going to be very frustrated. Okay, so let me, let me move on now to the next one, which is um, visualizing Git concepts in D3. So just very briefly here, this is a page, this is a, a Git website that is basically a Git simulator. It shows a lot of the same material that that last uh, Git reference site, digital Git reference site showed, but it basically does it interactively. And it's just a Git simulator, so you can't type in every Git command, it doesn't understand it. But if you stick with the commands that the site's been designed to work with, it's actually pretty helpful. Um, and I recommend everyone to walk through all these examples. I think you could probably do the whole thing in an hour, uh, or, or if you need more time, you can maybe click on some of the references that it links in here, but it's, I think it's pretty helpful. So let me just show you basically how this site works. Um, go to git commit. So heads sitting on master. 
And this site basically assumes that every time you type git commit, then I've already changed files and I've already staged them. So I'm committing files that I, that I staged and so on and so forth. So that's how you can grow the graph and see it interactively. Okay. Now, there's one other command that the previous visual git reference didn't cover that's very um, important to mention. And that's git revert. Now, uh, git revert is a command uh, that allows you essentially to undo changes that have uh, been made to your repository that have already been pushed to a shared branch. So let's say that I'm on the master branch and all the commits that I'm pointing to have already been pushed to the origin master branch that everyone's sharing. Now let's say that it's found that the, that, the, that the changes that were made in commit 0E70093 are just bad and problematic, that they cause important platforms to fail or, or they're just, just the wrong things entirely. We, and we want to undo it. Now in this situation, because I've already pushed these commits, I can't just reset the branch and rebase and do things like this. Um, otherwise, I screw up everybody who's already um, pulled the updated master branch. So instead, the way you can do that in Git is you can do a git revert. So what you can do is you type git revert, and then that's SHA-1, 0E7009. And what git does, it's like, it's, like, it's like an inverse cherry pick. What it does is it takes the patch that represents the changes from this version of the repository to the previous version, and it applies the inverse patch to the, to the current uh, uh, version of the repository and creates a new commit. So that's how you undo it. And then you can edit the commit message and so forth when it does that. Now, in terms of workflows, you really want to, you know, you shouldn't have a lot of reverts. If you're doing a good workflow and a good set of automated testing and so forth, you should have very few reverts. Otherwise, it just messes up your history. Um, but it's still a really important tool, and we have to have it, and it's important to know it. So that's get revert. Okay. Um, let me come back over here. All right. Now, the last few commands I'm going to describe, now everything I've described so far has strictly been about manipulating the Git data structure in a single repository. Now I'm going to move over and show some commands that deal with interacting between multiple Git repositories, and that's a distributed aspect of Git. So we've only got about 12 minutes left, so let me see if I can get this material a little bit faster here. So the first one I want to deal with is Git fetch. Now there's some really important concepts here, so I want to spend a little bit of time describing this, what this is showing, and what's going to happen here. So over on the left here in my local repository, um, I've got local branches called dev and master, and right now head is pointing to master, it's on top of master. Um, but I've got a remote reference set up to a remote, remote repository, which, which, which my local repository is called origin, okay? And since the last time I communicated with origin, um, the dev branch and origin and the mass branch and origin pointed to these commits over here, okay? So I've created, a new, I've created one new commit on dev and I've created two new commits on master since the last time that my local repository communicated with the remote origin repository. And over here on origin, I want you to note that I've got these same dev and master branches, but now um, someone has pushed two new commits to dev and three new commits to, uh, to master. So basically the histories have diverged between these two repositories. Now, my local repository has no knowledge of that because there's nothing magical about Git. It doesn't automatically know about the remote repositories. You have to do an explicit command to communicate. One way to do that is to do git fetch. So I want to note that when you type git fetch by default, what it does is it looks at the current branch that you're on, master, and it sees that, sees that branch has what's called a remote tracking branch. In this case, master is a remote tracking branch for origin master. So when you type git fetch, you type, you type git fetch, and that's just it. Um, it. It basically does a fetch on origin because that's the because that's because that's the remote that's related to the tracking branch for master. Hopefully that wasn't confusing. Um, but anyway, this is a special branch and it is tracking a re re remote branch. So git does kind of things magically there. So if I type git fetch, what, what fetch does it says, okay, I want you to go to my remote repository. I mean, implicitly it's origin here, but I don't got to type origin because again, this is a tracking branch on master. And go get for me the updated versions of the commits on these branches that I'm tracking. So now git goes and grabs those commits. And now you can clearly see the, the divergence between 
between the local repository and the origin repository. Um, and I'll describe this scenario and how, and, and, how, and how to deal with this next. But that's a really important, important aspect because now we're getting to the distributed nature of Git. Okay? All right. Let me come back here. Come back to push. So I'm going to cover Git pull and Git push all in the same time because they're very much related. So let's look at a scenario that is extremely common. Everyone has run into this. Who's ever done any work on a Git repository that shares a branch like Mass with other people? So here we have a scenario similar to the, to the previous uh, screen that I showed, where I've created a new local commit on master um, since the last time I communicated with uh, Origin, and someone else has pushed a new commit uh, to master. So now the histories of the master branch have diverged between my remote tracking branch, my local branch. So if you type just git push here, git stops you and it says your, your push is rejected, it's a non-fast forward push, which, which basically is telling you that the histories have diverged. This is not like SDN, it's not going to automatically just merge things together. So you have to resolve these things. So let me tell you the way that most people do this, okay? So typically they go, oh, okay, so things are diverged, so I'll just pull. If you do git pull, what git pull does by default with git is it doesn't, it doesn't fetch, to get the updated Git references, um, and then um, and then uh, it does a merge. Actually, it does a merge. So Git pull by default does Git fetch and then merge, and then they say, "Oh, Git push." Okay, so now they've got this really ugly uh, merge commit. This is called a trivial merge commit for people who you know Git and. There's people in workflows here that will pull several times and have like five or ten of these merge commits and they push it up to the history and make this mess of the history. So this is not the recommended workflow to do with Git if you're trying to maintain a, you know, a single branch workflow essentially, which is probably 90% of the people that are using Git, I would guess. And if you look at the Git history with, with, with uh, developers that use this, I mean, it's, it's, it makes the history extremely difficult to see as the graph. So instead of that, the recommended thing to do um, typically is to rebase your local changes on top of the remote tracking branch. And the way you do that, now I just, I, 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 I closed my, 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 uh, my window to that site and opened a new tab so that it would go back um, and wouldn't remember my previous state. Now the right way to do this, typically when you're trying to maintain a single branch, and there's a lot of work, every workflow that where you reassure a branch with somebody involves this, so even the, even the topic branch workflow or, or, or the GitHub workflow if you're basically collaborating on the same topic branch. Anyway, so I've got local changes in master, and I want to just rebase those on top of origin master. So I do git pull dash dash rebase. What that does is it does a fetch, and then it does a rebase instead of a merge. So now what I'm doing is I'm rebasing my local commit or commits on top of origin master after I update the remote reference, and now I got a nice linear master, and I push. See, now I got a nice linear master over there, and if everyone does this, we keep a nice linear history on master. If we're not doing the topic branch workflow, well, this is the right way to do it. And again, this orphaned, this orphaned uh, commit, uh, 46E whatever, this thing will be reclaiming garbage collection, so you don't need to worry about it. Okay, so that takes me to the end of, uh, of, of this particular section. Are there questions on git fetch and git pull and, and push? Yes. We, um, we have one more question just coming yep. in. Um, yep. Uh, git pull rebase, is that the same as git rebase origin master? Yep. In fact, let me show you that. It's a great question. So let's do this. Let's do git fetch. Now, so now I fetched it. Now I want to rebase it. Git rebase origin master. See? Same thing. Exactly the same thing. So when you type rebase without that reference, I think it's, I think it, well, at least git pull rebase makes uh, origin master uh, the default. Let me type git rebase. Yep, so it's exactly the same thing. 
There you go. Okay. Now, a very quickly, tag. I don't have much time to talk about tag. Um, tag is what you do when you want to give names, uh, name pointers into commits. Let's say, and let's do a quick release branch workflow. Oh boy, uh, what's better, rebase or merge? I can't, I can't answer that because that's like asking, are oranges better or 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 are, are apples better? Uh, <laughs> it depends on a lot of different things. So. That's really a hey, workflow Rob. discussion. Yep. Can you see, can you answer the other one? Is what happens when rebase has conflicts? Oh, um, I think it puts you into conflict resolution mode, and you can update conflicted uh, commits, and then do a git add, and then do a git rebase dash dash continue. So it gives it gives instructions when it happens. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so when you enter a conflict during a rebase, it gives you instructions about about well, about what to do. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Git tag. So, git tag is used basically in like release branch workflows. Let's say I want to say git uh, check out a new branch to release 1.0. Okay. And then let's get let's get our release 1.0 ready ready to uh, re ready to release and change some updates some files or something to that. And I tag it. Git tag. Version one one dot one dot zero. Okay. And then someone finds some defects, so I commit again. And then I do my next minor release. Git tag B one one dot one uh zero dot one and so on and so forth. And back over here, I'm on master. All right, oops. Git checkout. There we go. I move along. Okay. So basically, what a tag allows you to do is basically check, directly check out a um, a, a version of the code. And for GitHub, that's about all you got to do to do a release is just basically a tag and push the tags. And then you can merge in. Merge in your current release branch. And ta da, I just showed you how to do uh, git merge rel. There, I just basically showed you how to do the basics of a release branch workflow. Bam. Okay. So that's tag. Hmm, we're about at the end of time here. Let me uh, show one last slide and put it up here, maybe to deal with questions here. Um, this is a single slide that I created that basically shows the basics of the Git data structure, both in a local repository and in other repositories. Um, and the key and the key aspects of this is that this this Git data structure is this graph is replicated in a bunch of different repositories. That's what the green is. It's basically, they all share a common history. They make some clones of each other. Um, and um, new parts of the graph are constantly being added independently in these various repositories, like this release 2.5 branch and commit only exists in a releases repository, and Bob's got his own topic branch over here in his repository. And the parts of the graph only come together when they're explicitly communicated, like with git fetch or git push. And what's interesting about git is that parts of this distributed graph may never come together. You have subcommunities that have parts of the graph that they don't share with any other subcommunities. Individual developers that have their own parts of the graph that they don't share with anyone else. So it's very interesting how sort of the distributed nature of Git and this distributed, and this distributed replicated uh, uh, graph of commits works essentially. But if you understand what's in this particular slide and what these things mean in terms of these branch references, tracking branches, so on and so forth, and, and the basic uh, commands and, and uh, that I showed earlier. And you're in a really good foundation for being really effective using Git and learning new workflows. And you're probably farther ahead than 90% of the people that are using Git probably in our community. So that's basically what I've got. Um, if any questions about that, um, and just reiterate that, yeah, I mean, you do really want to focus on learning on learning, learning Git as a data structure instead of core algorithms that manipulate that data structure. That's the best construction model for Git. And once you understand that, then workflows are pretty easy to learn and adopt, and you won't get confused. 
So, I'm, so Ross, we do have one here. more question. Sure. Uh, we do one more quick question. If conflict resolution gets really messy, is there a way to just stop and back out of the merge attempt? Yeah. So for so for rebase, you can just do abort. For merge, I think what I typically do for merge is as I just do a reset hard. Is what I do. Maybe there's another way to back out of a bad merge, but typically I just do like a reset hard. I think it might just be reset dash dash hard head if I remember right. I think that does it. But um, this reference here, where is this, this reference here? Um, how to undo almost anything in Git? I think that will answer. Uh, come and get screw ups, questions, and solutions. I think that basically covers what you're asking for there. I see. These are really good things to kind of browse over. If, if uh, you don't know these things, just spend, you know, a half hour just browsing through these references here. It, it covers a lot of these kinds of things. And so, so hopefully that was helpful, and hopefully people will spend some time going back over these references, um, basically the ones shown here, uh, and spend some more time with them and get, get some familiarity. Um, if there's more questions, I could stay on for a while and answer them. Um, if there is, is, is a desire for like an office hours for, for Git, um, we can do that later uh, in a couple of weeks that that may be announced. Otherwise, um, I think that's it. There are no more questions, Ross. Thank you. Okay, excellent. All right, so Osney, are we trying to like go to Osney now? No? Hi, I, I'm, maybe Osney is having a hard time getting off mute. So I'll just thank you everyone for participating. Uh, thank you, Ross, and all of the folks who are helping us answer questions today. Um, please be sure you take the survey. Uh, we will also be emailing everyone who registered and attended a copy of the slides again, as well as the video that we recorded today. And just a reminder, we have another webinar coming up called the Roofline Model, Wednesday, August 9th from 1 to 2 o'clock. That will be presented by Samuel Williams, and we will be releasing the registration page for that shortly. So. Um, so look for the next webinar, and we really, really appreciate all of your time and attention today. We're going to stay on here a few more minutes. If you do have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and have a, have a dialogue with the speaker, uh, Ross Bartlett. Thank you, everyone.